Great. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome. So we have another session that's kind of like a bonus or like a plus to ILU 2021. Uh, we still wanted to bring you this session uh, to you even a couple like two weeks after it's over. But like, you know, it's amazing content and I'm really excited to to, you know, introduce this session. So tonight we have uh, Gina Covarrubias uh, and this, the the title of the session is Career Purpose, When Work Isn't Working For You. And let me tell you a little bit about Gina. So Gina's distinctive background blends life coaching expertise with 12 plus years of engineering technology experience in the government, academic, and corporate environments, all within the aerospace sector. Gina is the founder of Deliberate Doing, an exclusive STEM coaching service dedicated to helping technical professionals fix their careers. She solves the common STEM problem, am I on the right path? As a former engineer, she identifies with a technical expert who doubts their personal or professional existence. When a discouraging career leaves you questioning an unknown future, Gina recalibrates your status to align with professional goals. Welcome, Gina. Thank you, Gianna, so much for that introduction and for having me as part of your conference this year, ILEW 2021. Um, it is my pleasure to bring some really awesome content tonight um, to our audience. And I'm gonna start sharing my screen here and I will maximize my slides. Okay. And uh, just confirm with me, you can still see them moving and everything is good. Okay, and then let me hide myself here in the corner. Okay, here we go. All right, welcome everybody. Tonight I'm going to talk to you about your career purpose and what does that mean? I'm going to talk to you about the fact that sometimes your work is not working for you. As Deanna mentioned, I'm an engineering life coach, and instead of standing here and talking to you about myself or my past, uh, what I'll do is I'll kind of insert some, some previous experiences of mine throughout my presentation, so that way you can get to know me a little bit more. Okay, and here we go. Here is our outline for tonight. So what I'm going to be talking to you about, the whole premise here at the top is I'm gonna to talk to you about external reward versus internal sufficiency. And you'll know what I mean by the end of this presentation. So I'd like you to take the next 50 minutes or so, and if you can, try to block out everything else in life, forget about responsibilities, forget about what you're gonna do next. This next hour is for you. Consider this part of your self-help routine. So here is a quick outline of what I'll be talking about tonight. And at any point in time, please feel free to put in your questions or comments into the chat box. At the end, we will go over everything and hopefully squeeze everything in there. So we're gonna to start tonight by introducing a topic that I call career attachment. So I'll explain what that means and how you want to avoid attaching yourself to your career. And then we'll talk about tools for autonomy, for professional autonomy, so that you don't have to be so dependent on your career. And that will lead us right into career purpose. Now, I spoke with many of you, thanks to the speed networking during the conference. And um, I think a lot of what I'm going to talk about tonight will help you with some of the issues um, and problems that you've articulated. So again, it's my pleasure to bring this content to you. And it doesn't really matter actually if you're currently a student, if you just started your career or you're getting ready to start your career, or maybe you've had an internship or two, this information is applicable no matter where you are. So when I say the word career, if you're a student, then that's your career. So these are some hard lessons learned I wish I would have known back in the day. Now let's get started with a quote that's gonna set the tone for the rest of the evening. No matter how good they are at what they do, all healthy human beings have an inner stream of thoughts and feelings 
that include criticism, doubt, and fear. To advance in our careers, we need to update these narratives the same way we update our resumes. We need the resilience to deal with the only constants of each day, ambiguity and change. Now, Susan David is a very famous Harvard psychologist, smart lady. What she is telling us here is that the only thing that's constant is change. So what that means is as students and as professionals, we can plan all we want for the future, but things are not always going to go according to plan. So we want to be able to be resilient and agile and flexible to adapt with the times. And that is part of what I'm gonna teach you tonight. So here we go with section one. Career attachment. Now, most of us are STEM professionals, right? And we're really proud of it. We have worked very hard to earn our degrees and we expect a lot out of our career, whatever that may look like. We have high expectations because darn it, we worked really hard for it. Now, what happens is we get out there and we start working and this newfound career that we have, we kind of start becoming attached to it and we wanna start nurturing it and we wanna start developing it and nourish it as if it were a baby. And over time, you start identifying yourself with this baby. But there's a problem with that. The problem is that it's not a baby and you're fostering this emotional relationship with this job or with this career that you've created for yourself because you worked so hard to get it. So the problem is that you're attaching yourself to this job where you're clinging to this career. And what that means is that your quality of life takes a roller coaster ride. When the job is good and things are well, then life is awesome. But when you're attached to your career and the career takes a turn for the worse, then your personal life suffers. And then you start thinking about um, questioning your decisions or should I leave this job and start a new one or should I go back to school and on and on. So the idea of being attached to your career means you are dependent on your job to feel good about who you are. That means that you depend on your job for certain outcomes. So for example, if you say to yourself, let's say you're a student, and if you say, man, if I don't get an A on this exam, then I'm just going to go uh, stick my head in the sand all weekend, and I'm not going to talk to anybody, and I'm going to be depressed about it. Or if you're a working professional, and if you say to yourself, you know, if I don't get a good raise this year, I, be I better get a good, grade, good raise because I've been working hard. And if I don't, I'm going to be mad. So when we do things like this, that means we're attached to our career and we're attached to a certain outcome. And what I want to teach you is you can be happy and you can be whole with who you are despite any outcomes that happen. So career attachment leaves you very dependent on your employer or perhaps on your professor or on this degree that you're working so hard for. And here are a few examples of what career attachment might look like. If you ever said, I better not say no to the boss. I have to do everything they say, otherwise I might get punished. If you've ever said to yourself, man, I hope they like me. I really hope they hire me or I need this job, I have to have this job. And lately, let me tell you, I've had a couple of people tell me I have to have this job because of COVID and because of bills and all other sorts of reasons. Or I deserve a promotion. Okay, so that was me before. I felt entitled to certain things. I deserve a promotion. That sets you up to be disappointed because you have no control over whether or not you get a promotion. Or I have to work at this place because they provide great benefits. Okay, that's another example of you depending on your employer. 
Since you start identifying with this baby or with this career that you've created, it's easy for you to fool yourself because career attachment can lead to sometimes self-destructive behaviors such as some of these. You're not getting enough sleep or you're sacrificing family time or you're starting to job hop. You resent yourself or you resent your employer. You start questioning yourself or you burn out. You quit or you get depressed or worse. So I don't want you to become attached to your career or to a certain outcome and be just like this guy who clearly is sleep deprived and he's walking around with his mug that says, I love my job, even though the look on his face clearly says, I don't wanna be here. And he's probably dying inside. Okay, we don't want to be there. That's a toxic place to be. So question one, for those of you who are attending, is your career or your job who you are? Do you consider it to be part of your identity? So just put a yes or no in the chat for question one, and um, we'll come and visit this after I'm done with my slide presentation. But I will tell you, um, for me, for most of my professional life, I identified myself with my job. I thought I was my job and that there was no boundary between the two. And um, that led me to a couple of depressions that led me to job hopping, that led me to searching for this dream job that I thought was out there that I couldn't find. And the harder I looked for it, the more I failed. And then the worse I felt. So we don't wanna be in that position. That is not a healthy way to live. So this concludes section one. And what I'd like to do is read you this quote. This is a great summary of section one. Clinging to borrowed goods is a recipe for pain. So what I want you to know here is that your job isn't something you own. I want you to think of it as something you're simply borrowing. You are temporarily borrowing this job to better yourself. And we'll talk about that more when we get to career purpose. Okay, now I've got a couple tools to introduce to you to help you separate yourself from your job because these are two different things and to help you not be so dependent on your employer. Okay, so tool number one, learn to separate self-identity from job identity. And here on this slide is a basic explanation of the two. So what you do is based on action and that involves the external world. When I say the word external, that means anything outside of you, meaning anything outside of your brain. So when you do jobs, when you do tasks, when you do functions at work, those are all external and those are all things that you do. And when we think of achievements and awards, those are also external to you. So those fall in the category of things that you do. They're action-based, they're external, they're outside of you. You don't necessarily control those things. Now, who you are is a whole nother story. Who you are is internally based. Who you are depends on your belief systems that you hold. Who you are is your essence inside of you. And let me tell you, all of us are 100% worthy, no matter what we do, whether or not we're working, whether or not we graduate on time, none of those things matter in the big scheme of life. You are a spiritual human who is worthy no matter what you do, no matter how many times you failed, no matter what you accomplish. We all have intrinsic value as humans and not one person is more valuable than another. Okay, so we've got two different categories here. We've got the things you do, actions, those are external. And then there's who you are that's internal, that is based on your brain. So I want you to remember, try to avoid blending your self-identity with your job identity. 
And remember that you are not your job. Think of your job as a temporary borrowed tool for self-development. It is a tool that you're going to use in life. Jobs come and go. Jobs are fluid. Jobs are very unpredictable. So going back to Susan David's quote, be prepared to be flexible and agile because you never know from day to day what's gonna happen with your job. So just be prepared and don't cling. All right, autonomous tool number two. I'm gonna to talk to you about three swim lanes in life. Okay, so the first swim lane in life is the swim lane of the world outside of you, which includes the universe. That includes outside circumstances, things that go on around you, whether at work, at school, at home, uh, work situations, school situations, the things other people do and say, those are all external to you. So that's lane number one, the world's lane. The second lane is other people's lanes. So other people in their day-to-day, -day, they go about their lives and they're in their own lane. That means they get to do what they want. They get to say what they want. They get to act how they want, within reason, of course. They get to um, live how they want. They get to vote how they want. So those are other people's lanes and other people's lanes have nothing to do with you. They're not your business. So this is, I would say, a, a common um, stressor in the workplace is when people think it's okay to make other people's business their own business. That is a surefire way to cause yourself stress. Now there's one thing to say about having to work with people and having to collaborate and be in a team, that's all fine and dandy. But when you try to stick your nose inside someone else's business, um, such as where they go to church to worship, or if they celebrate certain holidays, or you know, getting into other personal stuff, that is their lane that really is not your business. So in lanes one and two, the world's business and in other people's lanes, you really don't have any control over these things. So stop trying to control them. What you do have control over is your own lane. This is exactly what you control. And in this lane, this includes your thoughts. This includes your belief systems, your convictions. This includes the way you approach things. This includes the attitude you choose to have, your willingness, your responses to certain situations. All of these things fall inside of your lane. That means you get to control them. And that also means this is where your power lies. You can be most efficient. You can be most productive. You can be less dramatic. You can have more self-awareness. You can be more accountable to yourself when you try to live your day-to-day -day living in your own lane and leave other people's lanes alone unless they invite you to come into their lanes, which is a different story. So the takeaway about lanes here is that the more you try to control the things that are outside of your control, the more out of control you're gonna feel. Okay, it's a vicious cycle. So that's what I want you to know about the swim lanes. Try to focus on your own lane which includes your own responses, your own thinking, your own attitude. And that brings us to autonomous tool number three. Okay, so this picture here is uh, basic cognitive science. What this says is that we have thoughts or we can call them beliefs. And these thoughts create feelings inside of us. <clears throat> and another way to think of feelings is emotions or energy. So we believe something, it creates energy inside of us. Based on this energy, we go and act and we behave certain ways. And those behaviors reinforce the way that we think. So that's very basic uh, cognitive science here. And we're gonna take this one step further. And I'm gonna teach you a very useful self-awareness tool on the next slide. 
This tool is called the STEER Energetic Framework. Now the S stands for situations. Situations are all those things external to you. They're outside, floating around outside of your brain. So situations lead us to think thoughts. That's what the T is for. And then the E is the energy that's produced inside of us based on the way we're thinking. And then we go and act and we behave, or maybe we take inaction based on this energy we've created inside of us. And when we take all of these actions that we've done and we put them together, that creates our reality for us. So the takeaway here is that your thoughts and your beliefs are propagating your reality. So I'm gonna walk you through a demonstration and we are going to take a look at a certain situation in the next two slides and I'm gonna show you how this works. Now the situation on both slides is going to be the same. I'm not gonna change the situation, but what I am going to change is the thought. And then you'll see how the reality is different. Okay, so this is just a, a brain exercise just to give you a heads up. So I want you to think here. The situation is that you, you're working on a current project, whether it's at school or at work. And one thought you might have about this project is I might mess up or make a critical mistake. And that thought haunts you and follows you day to day. From this thought, from this belief, it's probably gonna generate this kind of rigid and hypervigilant energy inside of you, um, maybe even a little bit of paranoia, um, maybe even a little bit of um, pressure or stiffness. Uh, we could go on and on about the kind of energy that this might create for you. Based on that energy, some of the actions that you're gonna take is number one, you may start getting into damage control mode before there's any damage at all because you're awfulizing or you're catastroph catastrophizing, you're speculating about the worst. Another action is you're gonna be questioning yourself. Am I doing it right? Am I doing this right? You're gonna over perfect your answers. You're gonna to try to show up confidently, although inside you're probably not. You're gonna over verify your work or your data or your numbers. You're gonna worry about the future and you're going to exhaust yourself because of this thought, I might mess up, I might make a critical mistake. The reality that these actions you've taken, the reality here is that you have created conditions to actually help you make a mistake or mess up, which is exactly what you're trying to avoid. So this is what we do to ourselves, okay? You're setting yourself up to actually make a mistake. So the takeaway here on this slide, is that, that that energy, that rigid hypervigilance doesn't come from the situation. It's not due to the project. It comes from your thought. I might mess up, I might make a mistake. On the next slide, I'm gonna walk you through another demonstration, but we're gonna keep the same situation. Now here's a different thought that you could have about this tough project. Given the information at hand, I'm using my best judgment. Now, if you truly believe that about yourself, the kind of energy you're probably gonna generate is you're gonna feel assured, you're gonna feel resilient, you're probably gonna be very confident, you're gonna feel like I have my own back because I'll be able to show data that will support my decisions. And based on this kind of energy, the actions you're most likely going to take are number one, you're gonna reasonably challenge yourself. You're not gonna be a perfectionist or over verify. You're going to accept your own answers and your decisions. You are going to be willing to face consequences and learn from any mistakes that you do make. And you're gonna show up confidently because again, you know that you have your own back in this situation. The reality here, based on your thought, is that you're creating agility and security for yourself despite an unknown future. Because you don't know what's gonna happen in the end, but you know you can back yourself up. 
So this is a demonstration of how two different modes of thinking can produce very different realities for you. So this tool, this STEER energetic framework, I encourage you at some point when you have 10 or 15 minutes, write down on a piece of paper in a column, S-T-E-A-R, and start filling it in. You could start on any line. You could start with a thought that's plaguing you. You could start with um, energy that you're feeling that you're not sure where it's coming from, or maybe there's a desperate situation. And you can start with the situation at the top and then fill in the rest and see what it gets you. See if you're able to come up with your own reality. And if you have trouble with this exercise, just let me know, send me a note. I can, I, I'm more than happy to help walk you through it to make sure you're doing it properly. So again, the takeaway here is that it's the same situation, but a much better outcome. Now, for me, when I get emotional, when I get stressed, when I get anxious, if I have a bag of chips laying around in the house, guess what I'm going for? I'm going straight for that bag of chips. And when I'm stressed and anxious, and it, when that's the kind of energy I bring to eating chips, which is the action, I shove them down my throat and I eat them as fast as I can. And I don't even taste them. And then afterwards I feel terrible. And I say, why did I do that? Unlike other times, if I'm calm and I tell myself, I would like to enjoy some chips right now, I can calmly go grab one or two handfuls of chips, slowly eat them one by one and savor them. And it's a completely different experience. I feel great afterwards. And I say to myself, wow, that was amazing. Those tasted so good. So that is another example of when I'm not self-aware and when I don't stop to think about what I'm doing, if I bring anxiety and stress to my action, I'm just gonna eat them all and feel sick afterwards. But if I eat them from a place of peace and calm and love for myself, if I give myself permission to enjoy this treat, then it's wonderful and it's a completely different experience. So for those of you in attendance, if you feel safe sharing, what is your emotional outlet? When you know you do things and you're stressed or anxious or what have you, uh, let us know what, what it is you turn to. It could be food, it could be social media, it could be um, perhaps playing an instrument, it could be sleep. Curious to know what you guys do. Okay. Here is uh, another quote that summarizes section two, tools for autonomy. And this is from Susan David again. To truly show up at the office means making room for and labeling your thoughts and emotions and seeing them for what they are, information rather than facts or directives. This is what allows us to step out to create distance from and gain perspective on our mental processes which then defangs their power over us. So this is very important from Susan David. Remember that your thoughts and your emotions are simply information. They're not facts and they're not directives, okay? All right, that's the end of section two. Now we're gonna talk about career purpose. How does all of this lead into career purpose? One of my main messages about career purpose, and I missed the boat on this when I was a young professional, even when I was an experienced professional, I thought the purpose was to keep climbing the ladder. I thought the purpose was to keep making money. Oh boy, did I have it all wrong. Career purpose is not about trying to obtain externals that are out there in the world. So let me explain. Career purpose is not found in external destinations, such as the money, the titles, the benefits, the prestige. Okay, I mentioned dream job earlier. That was one of my biggest hangups as a professional. 
I was always looking for that dream job. What I want you to know is that these externals, while they're great and they're dandy to have, these are, these are byproducts of why you work. These are byproducts of a career. These are not the purpose of working. The purpose of working is shown here in the schematic, service development and legacy. Now, what service development and legacy have in common is that these are continuous internal journeys. They are not external destinations. So that's a very big difference. And again, when I was a working professional, I missed this. Nobody ever sat me down and told me this was the case. I just thought I was supposed to keep working really hard and I was supposed to find my dream job. And when I didn't, I would fall into a depression and then I'd try something else and I would look again and things might be okay for a while. And then I would get depressed again and it was just a terrible cycle. So the big takeaway about career purpose, and I'll get into each of these here in the next few slides, is that the purpose of your career is to fulfill a continuous internal journey. It is not about external destinations that are out there, outside of your control. So number one is service. What do I mean by service? Service is contributing towards an organization, contributing towards a goal, towards an ambition that is something bigger than you alone. Service also means service to others, serving your colleagues, serving your bosses, serving your customers, even when they're difficult. And that's the hard part. That's where human nature comes into play. So in this table, I have a couple of examples. On the left are some thoughts that you might be tempted to have, and I would categorize these thoughts as thoughts outside of your lane. On the right, thoughts that are inside of your lane. That's where you have control, remember. So instead of asking, what am I getting out of this project? What am I getting out of this job? Why should I put in the extra effort to do X, Y, and Z when the other people aren't? Instead, I would encourage you to ask, what can I put into this? What is my contribution? How can I serve? The second example, other people around here, they're not pulling their weight. And I have been in that situation before at work, trust me. So instead of having that mentality, take control and ask yourself, how can I help other people around me succeed? What can I do to help? The third example, this isn't part of my job. Why should I do that? Well, if you stay inside your lane, you could instead ask yourself, where can I add value for the sake of adding value? Where can I add value just because I can? Again, these are not easy things to do. And the last one, I wonder how much of a raise I, I'll get. So this used to be me. I used to be, I wouldn't say obsessed, but I was very concerned with my salary. And I was always very concerned with how much of a, of a raise am I gonna get this year? I would encourage you, get back into your lane instead and ask, I wonder how I can, how I can raise my own standards. That is something you do have control over. So the takeaway here is to approach your work from an attitude of service, which means how can I serve the organization? How can I serve the people I'm working with? What can I do to rise above all of the drama? What can I do to rise above the person who treated me nasty? Okay, that takes a lot of emotional maturity. Number two, development. Part of the purpose of your career is to develop yourself as a person. You always want to be progressing. You always want to be learning. You want to enhance your self-awareness, which means knowing who you are. You want to evolve your brain. So I'm encouraging you here when it comes to development to practice curiosity and exploration. So instead of just being diligent, which I have a few examples on the left, be curious. Instead of saying, I'll just do it the way I was told, or let's, I'll just use the standard template because that's what's here, or I'll use this outdated procedure, 
or instead of saying, I'll wait and see, be curious, be more proactive. Ask, why are we doing it this way? Can I create my own template instead of using this one that doesn't seem very efficient? How might I be able to update this outdated procedure instead of just going with it? Because that's the easier thing to do. Instead of sitting back and saying, I'll just wait and see what happens. Ask yourself, how can I be proactive here? What, what else can I do? Is there something else that I'm missing? So when it comes to development, practice being curious and exploring. Again, whether you're at work or if it's at school, okay? Part of our purpose as humans is to constantly evolve and grow our species. And going to work is simply one way to do that. Now, the last purpose of having a career is your legacy. And what I mean by legacy is to improve everything you touch, improve everything you come across, leave every person in a better state than you found. This also means applying your own brand and your own authenticity to conversations or to your work. That requires you understanding who you are. Legacy is about maximizing your impacts. Every single one of us has gifts and skills and strengths and weaknesses that we can apply. So part of your job is to figure out what those are so that you can maximize your output to the world. And then the last one, lead yourself as a proactive change agent. So I will have to say this is another mistake. I made in the professional world. I was not leading myself. I sat back and I always liked being in the background, by the way. I did not like attention. I didn't like people coming my way. That made me very nervous. I kind of wanted to be a loner. But I would sit back and just wait for my employer to say, here, Gina, do you want to take this training or this training, this certificate is available to you, Gina. Do you wanna, are you interested? I just sat back and waited and waited. I thought it was their responsibility to help develop me and to initiate things like training or professional development. I was not my own proactive change agent. And that's one thing that, um, that's one mistake that I made. So again, whether you're at school or at work, initiate these conversations with your boss, with your management. So the thing about legacy is to always leave your occupation in a turnkey status, always leave it ready to hand off to the next person and always leave your company in a better framework than you found it. Those are the three pillars of career purpose, service development and legacy. And the best news about it, the best news about your career purpose is that guess what? You don't even have to be employed. Employment is not required. You can still serve people. You can still develop yourself and you can still leave a legacy even if you're not working. So for those of you who find yourselves in a gap between jobs or maybe someday you might find yourself laid off and you're out of work for a couple of months or maybe you feel like, you know what? I just wanna quit and take a couple months off you can still take time away from work and serve and develop yourself and leave a legacy. And here are some ways you can do that. So I've got a list here, everything from nonprofits to schools, churches, boards. You could be a mentor, you could be a coach, you could be a teacher. So the thing is, is when you fill your time doing these things, when you fill your time serving, when you fill your time developing yourself and leaving legacies, then when you do go to your next job interview, whether it's months away or years away, you can come to them and say, here you go. I've been out of work for two years, but guess what? These are all the things that I did in those two years. Here are all the things I accomplished. Here are all the things I learned. Now the takeaway from this slide is that Working without the expectation of a reward can be one of the most rewarding journeys that you might experience in your life. And that is the wonderful thing about career purpose is that you don't have to be employed 
in order to fulfill the three pillars of service development and legacy. Whew, okay, so your brains are sweating, just like this brain here, lifting weights. This, I think this is what I've done to you tonight. So let's recap what we learned real quick. I talked to you about external reward versus internal sufficiency. That was the whole premise behind this presentation tonight. And this is important because many of us go out into the working world and we try to achieve external de destinations, such as the money, such as the title, such as the benefits and so on. And what I wanna say is not only do those things not make you happy, but those things do not fulfill you internally. So I want you to ask yourself, am I seeking external reward in my studies or in my career? Or am I working toward internal sufficiency? Two very different things. Number one, the first thing I taught you was the idea of career attachment. Now, while it's essential to nurture and grow your career, I'm not saying that's a bad thing. Of course, we want it to thrive. I want you to watch out for being dependent on certain outcomes. Don't expect that you're gonna get that job interview. Don't expect that you're gonna get that certain raise. Um, don't expect to get a certain reward and on and on and on. Those external things don't matter in the big scheme of life. What matters is what's going on internally. Number two, I taught you a couple of autonomous tools to help you detach yourself from your career so that you have more power over your choices. And if your employer, let's say, tries to take advantage of you, if they try to overwork you, if they try manipulating you, I want you to be in a position, I want you to feel autonomous and secure enough where you can say, you know what, thanks for the offer, but no, I'm not gonna work again this weekend. Or thanks for the offer for taking on this extra work, but no, my plate is full, thank you. I want you to feel confident enough to push back and defend yourself. So the takeaway from section two is that security comes from within, it comes from up here. Jobs do not provide security. That comes from you. That's your job to provide your own security. And then number three, I taught you that career purpose is to serve and develop and to leave a legacy. It is not to go out there and seek external destinations. And with that, I would like to leave you with this wonderful quote from Robert Kiyosaki. Don't be addicted to money, work to learn. Don't work for money, work for knowledge. Now, money is just one example in here. We could switch it out for a title. Uh, we could switch it out for benefits. We could switch it out for retirement. The point here, what he's trying to get across, and Robert Kiyosaki, by the way, he is the author of Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Very famous book. So you get the idea. Work for knowledge. Work for the sake of working. Work because you truly want to learn. That's why you work. All right, and I'm gonna leave you with a final quote. And this is from me. Life is not about what the future brings to you, but what you are bringing to it. What are you bringing to your future? Are you bringing drama? Are you bringing blame? Are you bringing emotional security? Are you bringing lessons learned? What is it you're bringing to your future? That's what matters. So I would love to hear from you. Uh, my email is here, gina at deliberatedoing.com. And I would love if, if you let me know, how is your work working for you? Again, whether you're a student or a professional, how is your work working out for you? Let's talk about it. Now, if you haven't seen my website yet, go to deliberatedoing.com. I have many videos on there as a resource for you. And I have a career blog for those of you who like to read. Um, I do have an events page because I like to hold webinars just like this um, every so often. 
I do teach a life skills and a professional development course. It's called Overcoming Career Constraints, What College Doesn't Teach You. And the premise of the course is that um, career growth really comes from personal growth. And they don't really teach us that in college. Um, I've got free strategizing. If you want to have free coaching sessions with me, just let me know. I'm happy to do that. And I also have a monthly newsletter that you could sign up for. So that's my website, deliberatedoing.com. And I don't think I said this in the beginning, but my mission, the whole purpose I'm in business and the whole reason I'm standing here today in front of you is because I help STEM professionals, specifically engineers, defeat career struggles and career despair. That's my purpose in life. That's what I do because I have been there, done that. And then the last thing I'd like to share is just a short appendix here. Um, I'm happy to send a copy of my slides to everybody. And back here in the appendix, I have another quote for you to read through. And I put in a couple more um, examples of the STEER energetic framework. So here we have a situation, current job, and then another situation, boss. And you can go through those on your time. Okay, I'm gonna stop sharing now.